are looking at uh, equalization. So we can have equalization in the transmitter. We'll have a channel. We can have linear equalization in the receiver. Then uh, we can have the decision feedback equalizer. Okay. And the decision itself is made by the CDR. I'll show it like this. Here the output is the output data, not the clock, right? The recovered clock also comes out. But as you know, uh, uh, clock and data recovery circuit recovers the clock. And it also has a switch off which is clocking the data with that clock, right? So the data comes out here. And the data is delayed. Weighted and fed by. So this could be. You can have more tasks than that. I'll assume that. Basically, the previous symbol, it comes back with the weight of H1. And we can also have more tasks. This comes with the weight of H2 and so on, where H1, H2, H3 are the, uh, ideally, they should be set to the post cursor types of the entire pulse response. Everything that appears before here, right? So then it will cancel the symbols in the So this is the decision feedback equalizer, okay? And each of these have some good and bad things. The transmitter, in the transmitter, we have a digital data, the full amplitude digital data. So it's easy to implement the FIR type of filtering using flip flop, right? We can have a semi digital FIR implementation of the equalizer. Now, in the receiver, we can have a continuous time linear equalizer. A good thing about this is that. It will boost the high frequencies. You can have low frequency gain to be one or whatever it is that you want. And it doesn't depend on the CDR being operational. Okay. It just, it's like completely analog. It just opens up the high. And finally, we have the decision feedback equalizer. It's very effective because it doesn't, uh, it cancels interstitial interference without boosting noise, right? Because the feedback is from the decided symbol, not from analog value. So once you make a decision, the noise is gone, right? The symbol could be right or wrong, but there is no noise riding on. Okay. So you have a decision feedback equalizer, which is more immune to noise, which is good because when you are in a crosstalk heavy environment, these linear equalizers tend to boost up the crosstalk as well, whereas a decision feedback equalizer doesn't do that. Okay. But of course, it can correct only for post cursor right? That's one thing. And the real challenge in implementing the decision feedback equalizer is that basically this, the first tap here, right? So that should come within one symbol interval. That is, you have to make a decision on what symbol it is and uh, multiply it by the appropriate weight and bring it back to the input to subtract it within one symbol interval. So for 10 gigabits per second, this is 100 picoseconds. And for 25 gigabits per second, it's 40 gigabits per second. So that feedback loop is very difficult to close because the amount of time you have is very small. Okay. So that's why uh, that is very challenging. And there are some architectures which try to uh, get around this. So we'll actually look at the DFT implementations in a little bit more detail uh, later. But this closing this loop is the challenge. But it's very effective and you can have like uh, for long channels, you can have many, many types of uh, DFP which cancels all the post cursor Okay. Any questions about any of these things? Oh, this pretty much is what a serial link transceiver looks like. 
the only thing is that it is possible in some cases for you to have maybe an amplifier and an EDC and do all of the equalization in the digital domain, both the linear equalization as well as this is a feedback equalization. That's possible. Okay. But of course, this means that the ADC has to be operating correctly and the ADC itself should be sampling things at the right extent. Now, of course, if you have an ADC which is sampling at a much higher rate than uh, the data rate, then there is no problem because you have so many samples, it's almost like analog. Okay, if you have, let's say, four or eight samples, but that is impossible in high speed uh, data link applications, right? You can't, you can't take a 10 gigabits per second signal, put a 100 gigabits per second, 100 gigabit samples per second HP on it. If you do that, it's very easy, but you can't do it. So, the ADC, the operation of the ADC itself depends on clock recovery. So, that's another challenge. Any questions about this? Like I said, if we have time, we'll also look at ADC-based uh, serial links. Now, in a real uh, situation, basically, we don't know what these tab values are, these different tab values, okay? That is the challenge, uh, the channel can be either short or long. Uh, it can go through one or many connectors and so on. So we frequently need adaptation, okay? We can uh, get the, if we know the channel exactly, we can set the tabs to be the exact value. So we need adaptation. On top of it, everything on the IC typically drifts a little bit with temperature. So, uh, to compensate for that as well, you need continuous adaptation. So, we will look at how to adapt, right? That is, if you have a filter and you want it to do something, we will define what that is. In our case, we want it to open the eyes, right? We will see how to do the adaptation, how to automatically update the tap value so that it goes to the right value, okay? We cannot assume that we know the channel input response exactly. Any questions so far? <clears throat> now, uh, let's see. So we want to make the decision here, okay? And there is some sampling clock. At the rising edge of the clock, you make the decision. So for now, I'll assume that the CDR has converged, meaning the clock and data recovery circuit is giving you the clock at the right place, okay? Now, what is the kind of signal I want to see at the input of the slicer? Basically, I would like to see an open eye. I'll show it like this. You, I think you know what these bands mean because uh, at every time instant, the value will not be a single one. There will be some spread. In fact, what I've shown is a very nicely open eye, right? So these are these transitions. They can have, uh, depending on the bit pattern, the transitions go through different paths, okay? And the clock is here, okay? So what is it that I want to see here? I want to see a signal like this, okay? So now what it means is I have to adapt the filter. I have to adjust the coefficient to the filter such that the input of the slicer looks like this. Is this correct? Is this clear? Okay. It's easier to think of it in terms of eye diagrams rather than the signal itself, but this is the idea. It should be as open as possible and it should be at the right amplitude. Okay. So now, and also, this is the decision threshold. Okay. So obviously, you want the eye to be symmetrically placed 
around the distance threshold. Otherwise, I mean, if it is skewed, either for once or minus once, you will have a higher filter rate, right? That is, you know that if the symbols are equally probable, the decision, ideal decision threshold is exactly midway between the symbols, okay? So, this is my target. Okay. Now, there is some level which I define to be V0. That is my plus one symbol. And I'll assume a symmetrical situation. So then minus one symbol will be minus V0. Okay. And that's the target I want to hit. So that means that Actually, at the sampling instant, I should be seeing only either V0 or minus V0. I know in reality, this is not possible. So what I would really like is maybe the spread around V0 should be as small as possible. Spread around minus V0 should be also as small as possible. Okay. So I have to define some voltage like this. This voltage is defined based on uh, uh, what is the amplitude you can handle linearly and so on. Because everything that appears before this, that should be a linear operation, right? We have weighted summations. Basically, we have filtering. That should be linear. So if you choose V0 to be very large, it is great for the slicer because you have a large voltage to operate with. But the circuit that comes before may not be able to supply that voltage in a linear way. You know that every circuit has some swing limit, right? So you can't do that. And then uh, similarly, if it is too small, it's great for linearity, but then the slicer will have a very difficult job because it has to make decisions from very small amplitude. Okay, so you choose some V0 appropriately. That I assume you have done. So now, where does the input come from? I will show it as a linear combination of a whole bunch of signals. Okay, now what could that be? First of all, it could have the analog equalizer and it can have the decision feedback equalizer. But I'll just assume that every filter is a linear combination of some signal. Okay, it is like that, right? Every filter is in fact like that. At least it can be represented like that. Okay. So maybe there's a whole bunch of signals, X1. C1, X2 multiplied by C2, from Xm multiplied by Cn. Okay, it's very easy to see in the DFE context that these uh, some values of Xs are basically delayed decision values, right? Similarly, this uh, continuous time linear equalizer, it could be potentially realized as two paths, one which is high frequency path, other which is low frequency path, which is weighted and summed, okay? For instance, you could have one by one plus S by P1, which is a low pass path, and S by P1 by one plus S by P1, which is a high pass path, and I could multiply this by C1 and this by C2. And you can see that the relative values of C1 and C2 will decide the zero and consequently the high frequency boost, okay? So if you want more high frequency boost, you should increase C2 and reduce C1 and the other way around, okay? Is this fine? So that's one, uh, that's basically about this uh, uh, linear combination. And on top of it, in a real circuit, what happens is when you have a whole bunch of circuits, the output of all of this stuff, all of this summation uh, will have some offset. I think you know why you have offset. You have random mismatches between two halves of the circuit which are supposed to be identical. That is one reason for offset. That can also be systematic offset because of some uh, way that you design the circuit. Okay. So typically, because if you do have offset, 
And this one, if I don't show anything else, the decision threshold is zero, right? That is, if V in is more than zero, it says that it's plus one. If it's less than zero, it says it's minus one. But if all of this together has an offset, then effectively the decision threshold is skewed, right? It is skewed by an amount equal to the offset. So I don't want to have that. So I would like to also add some offset. I'll just call it x0. This is called offset. Correct. Okay. Is this fine? So when I say I want to adapt, or maybe let me not do this, I will call this C0 and this is some fixed voltage. Okay. V offset or something. Okay. So what is my target here when I say I want to adapt the equalizer? What is it that I want to do? What is it that I should be doing? I mean what is the, what are the things that I will be changing? In a decision feedback equalizer, what should I be changing? Yeah, the weight, right? So everywhere here, basically, I have to choose these weights, C0, C1, C2, and Cn, so that I get the, I reach my target, which is to have a good eye diagram. And what is the meaning of a good eye diagram? At the sampling instant, I should see either plus V0 or minus V0. I know that that is not possible exactly. So what I'll do is, I will try to minimize the error from either plus V0 or minus V0. Is this is okay. Let me just call this Y. I'll just show it as a linear uh, combination of some X's. Okay. So this is Y, which is the linear combination, and this is either plus or minus V0. And how do you find the error? That is the error, right? That's uh, if Y was positive. This would be plus V0 and you will get Y minus V0. If Y was negative, this would be minus V0 and you will get Y plus V0. Basically, you will get the difference between the input value and the decision. Is this okay? We'll see how to implement this. This is not exactly how it is done. But this is. Uh, <coughs> So this depends on whether the uh, detected symbol is either plus one or minus one. Okay. Now what is my goal? I'll show just a linear combination, then I'll fill in the details of how uh, specific things about the offset and so on. Okay. So what is it that I want to do? This is, let me call this the error E. I want to minimize the squared error. That is the error itself can be either positive or negative, right? Because when you detect a plus one, the actual output voltage could be either 
above 1 or below 1. Okay. Similarly, when you detect a minus 1, it could be above 1 or below 1. So, I will keep getting some error. Now, this E square, if you average E square over a long period, that is like the energy of the error. And that energy is what I would like to minimize. Okay. So, basically, this is the minimum mean square error. Okay. So, I want to adjust the coefficient CK so that I minimize E square. Is this fine? So, then clearly if I succeed in this, what will happen? The values of Y at the sampling instant will be clustered around either plus 1 or minus 1. If the error is 0, what does it mean? Yeah, so y itself is either plus v naught or minus v naught. Okay, so that is the best thing. I mean, the i is like completely open, there is no spread at all. Okay, so what is the spread after all? Because if you recall the pulse response, if the pulse response with the timing adjusted to the sampling instant, if it is some uh, if it is like that, we know that this midpoint corresponds to what? In the eye diagram, see we have a pulse response. Okay, pulse response meaning I can evaluate the discrete time response by sending a single transmitted pulse and I assume that the sampling instant is like shown here. It is in the middle of this eye, whatever the sampling instant is. Okay, so then what is the what corresponds to the middle of this, uh, there is some spread here, what corresponds to the middle of that, what corresponds to the top, what corresponds to the bottom. Huh? What's that? Dimension XK is the top. No. What is summation XK? Of a digital filter, what is it? What quantity is that? Huh? Ah, that's correct. So when I uh, sum all the impulse response values, what do I get? DC gain. Okay, where is that? Which is the DC gain out of the three points? The middle value is the DC gain. So basically, this midpoint corresponds to summation HK. Okay, what does the top correspond to? Ah, this is summation mod HK. And what does this correspond to? Yeah, it's basically H0. I will assume H0 is positive. Basically, this corresponds to H0 minus everything else is subtracted off. Okay, so that's the worst case I have. So now, clearly, the spread around this value, right? Spread around V0. Why does it come out? It comes about only if this HK for K not equal to 0 has non zero value. Okay. Now, if there is no spread at all, what does it mean? HK for is 0 if K is not equal to 0. So that means that the impulse response is just an impulse. There is no interstimulus interference at all, right? Now, the larger the amount of spread, the more ISI you have. Okay, so from the midpoint, if you have the maximum, the ISI actually can either help or hurt you, right? If you want a positive value, it could be that all the ISIs add up in the same direction and also will give you a positive uh, interference. So that's possible. And then it can also give you a negative uh, thing in which case it subtracts from the uh, cursor. Okay, now if you have no interstimulus interference at all, there will be no spread. So that's the idea here, right? So, if there is no spread, that means that there is no interstimulus interference in the overall channel. Now, here we are looking at the pulse response not just of what I call the channel. It is channel plus equalizer, right? It is basically the pulse response up to this point Y. That is where we are measuring it. Is it okay? So, I have to adjust this value CK. So, every time I look at the value V and then based on that, 
I have to adjust the value of CK. Okay, so that this spread becomes smaller. How do I do that? Do you have any idea? Like how would I? I have so many coefficients. See, in which direction should I change that so that? Uh, So that the error is minimized. <coughs> now there is a standard algorithm called the elements algorithm, the least mean square algorithm, which uh, goes on changing CK until this gets minimized. And later we will have some. Uh, Variant of that which is easier to implement, which is known as sign sign element. And once we get there, actually, you will see intuitively it makes perfect sense. Okay, so first let me do the formal thing, after that, we will go to the intuitive thing. This uh, error is either y plus or minus v0, right. The squared error is either you will either get this or that get that depending on uh, whether the detected symbol is plus one or minus one. So this is this is what you get if it is plus one. This is what you, you get if it is minus one. Okay. Now the most commonly used uh, least mean square algorithm that is known as gradient descent algorithm that works like this. First of all, let me just take this. I mean, it works the same way with the other one also. Okay. Now, I look at the partial derivative with respect to the coefficients that's what i want to uh, evaluate right so what will i have this is basically so what will this be partial derivative only with respect to the coefficient ck what is that the idea is the following, right? The error goes on uh, changing, right? As you change the coefficient. Now, if with respect to some coefficients, the error has reached the minimum. That is, you cannot minimize it any further by changing a particular coefficient CK. What will happen? The partial derivative will be zero. Okay. So it is that point that you are looking for. Okay. You understand? So that is the minimum mean square error. So. With a particular coefficient, you may not reach an error of zero. That may not be possible. But you want to minimize the error. So when you minimize the error, the partial derivative with respect to that coefficient will go to zero. So then maybe you can you not maybe you should not change the coefficient any further. You have to look at other coefficients. Okay. So now, what is this value? The partial derivative of uh, the squared error with respect to CK. I wrote it as the product of error and the partial derivative with respect to of error with respect to CK. What is that? What is this? I mean, just go by the expression. What is it? And you can consider that there is only one term, that's all. What is it? It is XK, that's all. Okay. So, because CK is multiplying XK, the, if you change this by some epsilon, the amount of change here will be proportional to xk. That's all that's that is saying, right? So obviously, uh, the derivative will be large if the input quantity is large. This makes sense, right? Because if you are multiplying a large quantity, it will be more sensitive to that coefficient. If you are multiplying a very small quantity, it will not be sensitive to that coefficient. Okay. Is 
this point. So I have written it as a summation, but uh, if you find it difficult to operate with that, you just assume one coefficient and go with it. I think that is fine also. Okay, initially just to understand. It's all the same because now everything is independent, right? Because uh, you have so many coefficients, everything has to be adjusted independently. So now what is this gradient descent algorithm? So this is the following. It tells you how you must update the coefficient. That is, at some instant you have a coefficient value, you make this measurement of error. Based on that, you have to find the next value of the coefficient. Okay. So it says that uh, the n plus 1 value of the coefficient should be the nth value of the coefficient and you have to do something to it. So what should you do? So let's say you have this uh, partial derivative of v square. It comes out to be like this. So what would uh, make you decide to increase the coefficient value or decrease, decrease the coefficient value? Hmm? If error is increasing, coefficient has to be? If error is increasing with what? No, no. I mean, you have some uh, value of the error. Okay. What do you do next? It's only based on the magnitude of the error. Huh? One second. Yeah. What do I think? Yeah. Yeah. So what adjustment do I make? So if uh, y minus v naught is large, we have to increase that. What were you saying? Yeah, so basically you have to see, the. I mean, it's not even just the error is negative. In fact, that's why I took the gradient. It's the product of error and this, okay? So for instance, let's say this y is, uh, this error is positive, error greater than zero, okay? What does that mean? It either means that y is more than v naught if the symbol is plus one or y is more than minus v naught if the symbol is minus 1, okay? Either way, if error is more than 0, what should we do? We have to bring it down, okay? So let's say we are looking at the contribution of a particular xk, okay? So the error is more than 0. I have to reduce the sum. And let's say I am adapting only this coefficient right now. So if I have to reduce y, what should I do? xk, no, it's not just reduce c. If xk is positive, you have to reduce c, right? If xk is negative, you have to actually increase c so that y decreases. Is this clear? So that's why you get the, I mean, all I'm uh, describing is this whole partial derivative being to e times xk and words, that's all, okay? So just imagine that error is positive. To bring it closer to zero, you have to reduce y. So that means that you have to reduce the contribution from here. Reducing the contribution, uh, the way you have to change the coefficient to reduce the co contribution depends on whether x is positive or negative. So that's why you get the uh, product of xk and ck. So that was the intuitive explanation I was talking about. Is this okay? Is this clear? Okay. So now it turns out basically you do this. You uh, CK of n times mu C times x k. This mu is some parameter you control. Okay. That is, that kind of decides the largest step that you have in the coefficient. 
Now, the other things that come into picture, right? You don't want to be changing coefficients abruptly. Then something else will change, something else might happen to the other parts and so on. Okay? So, this mu is a step size control. If you choose mu to be very small, in every step you will be changing uh, CK by a very small amount. That means everything will go smoothly. But also it takes longer to get to the right value. If, because, I mean, you start from this value of the coefficient, you will get that. If each step is very, very small, then it takes a long time. At the same time, everything will change so, so smoothly that you will not have any other uh, weird effect, right? Whereas, if uh, mu is large less, you will get that quicker, but uh, you might get into some weird situation. Okay? Is this fine? At least, does it make sense, this equation? This is the gradient descent algorithm. That is, if E times XK is positive, you reduce the value of CK. E times XK is negative, you increase the value of CK. Does that part make sense? So, that's what I was saying. So, if E was positive, whether you, how you reduce the contribution depends on the sign of XK. Okay? So, this you do for Every coefficient, that's all. If it's a linear combination, now if you want the output of the linear combination to reach a target, this is what you do. I mean, this is not just for uh, this particular equalizer, for anything, right? So, this LMS algorithm works for anything. Any questions about this? Basically, what it is trying to do is Now, in a high speed equalizer, right, we have, we don't compute the error like this, okay, basically because uh, the flip flop itself will have a delay. I mean, the way I have shown it, why it will, uh, this will make instantaneous decision at the edge of the clock, and then we can find the difference between this and that. Okay. This is actually a little bit weird because this is a continuous time signal. This is changing at the edges of the clock, and I've taken the difference. If we sampled Y also at the same instant as the clock, if we had a sample and hold also at the rising edge of the clock, this would make sense. Okay. Then we'll get E, which are samples of the error. Okay. I mean, in general, what we do is something uh, slightly different from this. This cannot be implemented, in, especially at high speeds. The flip flop will have delay, and you don't want to put another sample and over. Okay. So there is a modification of this. One of the problems here. What problems do you foresee in this? Just to compute this. Ah, you have to pro compute the product of error and XK. In fact, I don't know. Do you know any analog way of computing the product? 
Actually, there is no good circuit, right? I mean, so far as I know, there are those multipliers and so on. They work at really low speeds. So you just can't be uh, fooling around with them. In a digital case, in a digital implementation, if you have an A2D and you are doing all the adaptation after that in digital, you could do this. But there also, you know, I think that uh, multipliers are very expensive in terms of resources and time, right? So, especially at high speeds, what you do is some crude modification of this. There are a couple of uh, possibilities. That is, instead of looking at E times XK, you look at the sign of the error and sign of XK. That is, you make one bit decisions on both XK itself and the sign, right? What does this mean actually? What is the difference between this and that? Basically here, the step size is a constant in the new case, right? Regardless of the value of E times XK, E could be very small. Even then you take fixed steps, okay? This is something like the, like a bang bang control, right? You don't really look at the value of the error. You simply, your step size is always fixed. But then you can take the step itself to be sufficiently small and you may be okay, okay? So this is known as the Sign, sign, LMS algorithm. Okay, and I think there can be variants where instead of uh, doing this, you could take e times sign of xk or sign of e times xk. I am myself not sure of uh, the motivations for doing this, but this is very clear. Basically, it's a one-bit computation, right? It's just sign of e times sign of xk. So one bit multiplication, which you can do with an XOR gate. So this is a lot easier to do. Anyway, we are making one bit decision for our uh, uh, data detection. The same thing can be done. Here. Is this okay? So essentially this means that the step size is always new. Okay. <clears throat> And this is what is frequently used in high speed serial. Yeah, we have to choose that. So, uh, what happens is this coefficient, right? The coefficients also frequently cannot be changed continuously. In fact, that's not how you design that. So, the way the coefficient is designed is you may have a differential pair uh, that is fed by. By the way, all this actually is most useful for the decision feedback equalizer. And actually for DFP, you do need adaptation. Okay, because you don't know the value to go back. The continuous time linear equalizer, typically you set it to some boots and maybe you leave it there or you program it. But for the decision feedback equalizer, you do need to have adaptation because you have no idea what all the so many different different responses are that DFP can be very long and so on. And in fact, the sign sign LMS is particularly suited also for the DFP. It's quite easy to implement because we already have sign of XK in our data. So anyway, to make these coefficients, uh, what is done is you can have a differential pair whose uh, tail current is changed in discrete steps. Okay, that's typically what you do. So. In that case, I mean, you don't have a choice of mu. Mu is basically the step size that you have. That's all. That is the minimum. I mean, there is no point using something larger than that. And you will never have like super high resolution for these steps anyway. I mean, especially if you are again talking about high speed circuits, you don't want to set it up into so many pieces. So maybe you will have five or six bit uh, quantization for these steps. Okay. So that is mu. So that depends on the step size that you have. Okay. So let me go to a little bit of uh, detail now. I have my decision slicer, okay? And what I do is the following. This is why V naught 
this is the node. So I can't take this, sample this, and subtract it from its output. Okay, but I know that it's either y minus v naught or y plus v naught. So I have two more. This is giving me sign of Y, which is the detected symbol, and this gives me sign of Y minus V naught, and this gives me sign of Y plus V naught. One of these is the sign of the error. Which one it is, I have to pick based on this. So I use a multiplexer based on this one, and I pick that. Okay. In principle, I could do this. Again, this may not be done at full speed, but this is what I did. Is this fine? So this gives me the sign of the error. Now, like I said, this is particularly suited for the decision feedback equalizer because if you have some arbitrary linear combination, to do this adaptation, right, you need to know the values of x1, I mean, what you are weighting and summing, okay? So you have to have some way of detecting that, or you have to put a comparator there to at least find its sign, if not the magnitude, okay? But in a decision feedback equalizer, what is it that we have? The linear combination is just, you have, delayed versions of the detected symbol, right? And you have H1, H2, and so on. And you wait and sum the, okay? So that's basically what's given to that one, right? So now, these are the xk values, okay? And you don't have to separately determine that. We already have detected the symbol. So those xk's are simply delayed versions of the symbol, okay? So that's also easy to do. Is it okay? Because anyway, I mean, our whole goal is to detect the data. We have detected the data. And detected data is, uh, are the xk's for the decision feedback equalizer. So you don't even have to do anything extra, at least not a lot of it. So the sign sign LMS algorithm, is particularly suited for the decision feedback. Okay. Is this fine? So the DFE, CDR, everything will be one big bit mass together because this flip flop here, which makes the data decisions, that is also the flip flop within the CDR, right? Because you would use the same flip-flop, that is the best thing. I mean, the same flip-flop should be detecting the timing as well as making the decisions because that is the flip-flop for which you have adjusted the timing. In principle, you could have one set of uh, flip-flops determining the timing and a replica one using the same clock, but there will be some responses and so on. So that's not the good thing. So the CDR, when we make the bang band CDR or the linear CDR, this is the flip-flop that is in that CDR, which is giving out the data. Okay? Any questions about this? So, especially DFE is very useful because it can correct for long post cursor uh, ISI, many uh, post cursor ISI elements, including things which are very far. Actually, it's not necessary to have every car. It could be that you have F1, S2, S3, and after that you say that, okay, next 5 or 0. And maybe because of some uh, far away reflection, you're getting X10, you can have X10 along. That is okay. So, uh, the way to adapt the coefficients is to use the LMS algorithm. You have to adapt the coefficients because the channel is uncertain. The chip itself will have its own bandwidth limitation that is not very well uh, known. Okay? And you will, I mean, it's not as though you design one chip for one particular channel, right? That should be used everywhere. So, uh, you use it for various channels and it has to be adapted. And the commonly used way of uh, adaptation is this LMS algorithm, which Basically, you have a target value for the uh, weighted summation y, 
you find the error from the target value and you adjust the coefficient so that you minimize the squared error. Okay. And the way to do that is by essentially individually adjusting each coefficient so that y moves in the right direction. For a weighted summation, this comes out very simply. And for a particularly simple implementation, you can look at the sign sign elements where you vary the coefficients by fixed step only by looking at the direction in which it has to be. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so please think about these things. Uh, I'll have some assignment about this also.